Amen. So he was the only righteous, blameless. The Bible calls him blameless. Who walks with God? Let's look up Job 36, chapter 36, verse 7. Who found it? You can just stand up and read it with a loud voice. Like in an audition, you know? God, you found it? Okay, what? read it. What? Job no. chapter 36. I'm not the other. Okay. Who is there? Mr. Nazem. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but the kings on the throne. He has seen them there forever, and they are exalted. Okay. Can you read that again? Because I didn't hear. He does, Job 36, 7, he does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but with kings on the throne, he has seated them forever, and they are exalted. Amen. So we see here that the Lord lifts up those who are righteous. We're going to read Psalm 143, verse 2. Anybody else? 143, verse 2. Lord claims your servant for prayer. Compared to you, no one is compared. Okay. Mine reads, do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. Do you see that there is a, a change? The Bible says, no, I was the only righteous man. But here it says, no one living is righteous before you. And then we will find Proverbs chapter 29, verse 7. Today is homework day, so I do nothing, I just give you to read. The righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. So what do the righteous do? Considers the cause of the poor. Consider the cause of the poor. So righteousness here is related to the poor. In fact, we find many scriptures about the poor in the Bible related to righteousness. And then we're going to find Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. 29, 20, 29. There is no one on earth who does what is right at all. The done and never make the mistake. So that must be except me. <laughs> There is no one, there is not a righteous man on earth, one, not one, who does what is right and never sins. So we're okay. Huh? You're not alone. Isaiah chapter 26. <coughs> we're going to read from verse 1 until verse 8. Chapter 26. The day is coming when the people will sing this song in the land of Judah. Our city is strong. God Himself defends this world. Open the city gates and let the faithful nation enter. The nation who the nation whose people do what is right. You, you Lord, give perfect peace to those who give their purpose fair and put their trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. He will always protect us. He has humbled those who were proud. 
he destroyed the strong city they lived in and sent its force crashing into the dust. Those who were those who were oppressed walk over it now and trample it under their feet. Seven. Lord, you make the path smooth for good people. The road they travel is level. Eight. We follow your word and put our hope in you. You are all that we desire. Amen. Amen. So, there are different versions of Bible. I would just read the last two verses. In my Bible it says, uh, He humbles those who dwell on high. Brother Francis says proud. His Bible. He lays the lofty city low. He levels it to the ground and casts it down to the dust. Feet trample it down. The feet of the oppressed, the footsteps of the poor. The path of the righteous is level. O oh, upright one, you make the way of the righteous smooth. This is the, um, again, this, this scripture talks about the oppressed and uh, talks about God lifting up the oppressed and bringing the proud down. Also talks about God making the way smooth for the righteous. So we're going to go on to Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 12. You think Ezekiel should read this one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chapter? chapter 33, verse 12. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. The righteous man, if he sins, will not be allowed to live because of his former righteousness. Listen to this. The righteousness of the righteous man will not save him when he disobeys. And the wickedness of the wicked man will not cause him to fall when he turns from it. Which means then, the man who repents, the person who repents, is absolved of the consequences of their wickedness. Spiritually. I don't mean physically or materially. So if, you, if you're going to become an alcoholic and you have a liver problem unless God heals you, you're going to suffer from that. You know? But spiritually, you are redeemed. So God will remember your sins no more. In the same way, the righteous man who is living righteously and becomes wicked, the Lord will not remember his righteousness because he has fallen into wickedness. It is what it says. It is a hard word, but it is it's the word of God. Okay. Habakkuk, chapter 2, you don't have to find that, verse 4. And Galatians, chapter 3, says, the righteous, of course you know this verse, shall live by faith. So the righteous person does not live by any other measures but by their own faith. And then we can find James chapter 5, verse 16. And if you find that, you can read it. James 5, chapter 5, verse 16. This is prayer made in faith. Will he the sick? The Lord will restore them to the help, and this thing they have committed will be forgiven. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful. So the Bible says, pray. If you need healing, if you need forgiveness, if there is trouble, pray. Because the prayer of the righteous one is powerful. So we can see that prayer without righteousness 
maybe it's, it's not biblical. Righteousness must precede. Prayer is the first step. And then we can find 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. First Peter chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. Maybe somebody else can read. Why? <laughs> Once you were born, you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now have received mercy. Dear friends, I call you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires, which was against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they are accused, they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Okay, which chapter is that? First Peter chapter 3. Yes. Okay, read 11 and 12. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. First Peter okay. chapter 3. Yes. Go. Between 10 to 12. Go. Sabrina, you can read. Okay, uh, 10, right? First <laughs> Peter 3, 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, 3 to 12. No, no, no. no. 10 to 12. Yeah. Three, chapter 3, verse 10. Yes. For whoever would love life and see good Thank days you. must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from the sinful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. For the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Amen. I think this passage is very clear again. We see that God is again emphasizing He hears the prayer of the righteous. So righteousness is very important. Um, we can find now just the last two verses. First John chapter two, verse one. First John chapter two, verse one. My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have Jesus Christ the righteous one. So, what it's saying here is, goes with what Ezekiel says. Do not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So it is the righteousness, we are made righteous by the righteousness of Christ, who gave his, his life, who shed his blood for our righteousness. And it is that way, it's not the righteousness of the human being, but it is by the acceptance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that makes us righteous, that we become righteous. Amen? That's why it says the righteous shall live by faith, because our faith is in what he did for us. And then we can find the last verse, which is 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 to 9. I'm going to read this one. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So here we see a little bit, as in my Bible, it's, the word is a little bit different. 
He who does what is right is righteous. But you see, biblically, to do what is right is different from what when the world says to do what is right. Okay? And I've met many people, I've had the, the privilege to meet many people who are good and they do what is right in terms of justice, in terms of compassion, in terms of uh, loving other people. But they don't know Christ. They don't know Christ. And I can say that I've met many people like that. Not a big number, but I've met people like that who are able to go the extra mile, who are able to serve, but they don't know Christ. And there's a difference because the Bible, if, if, if we read all these contexts, is making a point that righteousness cannot come from doing right. There's only one, one uh, source of righteousness, and that is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and believing unto him. It is the faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice that makes us righteous through which we're able to do right. But, I ask you this question. Maybe it's challenging this morning, but um, I think God gives us experiences and gives us, uh, gives us situations that we can use our mind. Why is it that the righteous sometimes don't do what is right? You know? It means the people who, who are made righteous by Christ don't do what is right. And if you don't believe that, you can read the Bible. There were people who fell away from Christ. There were people who did not do the right thing. And there are instances in the Bible, many instances, where people knew what they were supposed to do and they didn't do it. Okay? And uh, if you read the life of the apostles, they were called by God. They walked with Jesus Christ. But when they came to certain decisions, they failed. Because they are human beings, right? So, this is my, my, um, my question today. Is that if the Bible says that righteousness, the person who is righteous and becomes wicked, the Lord will not remember righteousness anymore. It means that it is possible. It is possible for someone to be righteous and forget his righteousness. It is sadly, but it is possible. It is possible for the church to forget who she is. It is possible for the Christian to forget who they are. And that is my, when I read these scriptures, that is what I am reminded when it comes to prayer is, do we pray from who we are, or do we pray because we have to pray to be blessed, or we have to pray for something, or we have to pray because, you know, in the church we pray, that's what we're supposed to do. But I know that when we pray from who we are not, it doesn't shake the heavens, it doesn't shake God. When we pray from who we are, that is when God hears. And it's biblical. The, the, that God hears the prayer of a righteous person. You know? And I tell you, this is maybe, um, you know, maybe it's a, it, it's a bit of a heavy message for me. Because it challenges us as Christians. It's so easy to say, we as Christians, we are, we are made righteous, so our prayers are going to be heard, so we are going to be blessed, so we have no problems, so we're never going to experience any, any harm. But actually, it's not true. It's not true. When I look at, at, at Christians, I see sometimes a different story. And I see this lack of acceptance, that we are also vulnerable people vulnerable to harm, vulnerable to suffering, and even vulnerable to losing our faith. And unless we realize that, in fact, Peter says, the devil prowls around you like a roaring loud lion, waiting for someone to devour. Now, should we be afraid? No. Why? Because
because we have Jesus with us. But aware, yes, we should be aware that we can lose our faith unless we stick close to Jesus. And he is the author of all righteousness. When we come to making decisions about what is right, I always say, what standards will I take? Whose standards will I take when I come to make a decision? You know? Maybe I will speak to 10 people, Christian people, and they will tell me the same thing, but God wants that one thing which is different from the expectations that people are putting on me. What will I do? And we see this, this, these decisions with Jesus. We see how Jesus was persecuted in the temple by the high priest. We see how Peter said, no, you shall not suffer. And Jesus said, get away from me, Satan. Because Jesus saw that if he did not sacrifice his life and shed his blood, we will not be saved today. And so we belong. We have that legacy. Amen? Amen. We have been made righteous and given a legacy by Jesus. But it is not easy. So the first thing that we look at when we look at righteousness, we have to admit that right in the world is not righteousness with God. We have to admit that. The, 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 the concept of righteousness, we have to put of our glasses, or if you're like me, you have contact lenses. You have to put them off and put another type of glasses on. When we talk about righteousness of God, we can't look with our physical eyes. You know, if Jesus had to look with physical eyes, I think half the people he picked, he would not have picked. Probably he would not have picked me. I don't know. We have to put another glasses and look at ourselves and at others with different eyesight altogether. That's why we call him Dr. Jesus. Because Dr. Jesus heals the eyesight. You start seeing things not as you have been taught, as you have been uh, brainwashed, but, but you start seeing things as Jesus sees it. It makes, it, it makes a big difference in my life. You know, when I put on the television, I always say this, and I see all these adverts, I say, you start measuring yourself, and you say, oh, I need to lose weight. I need to lose weight, I need to, I need to be fit, you know? And I need to go to a new hairdresser. And I need, and I need, and I need, and men need some things, and women need other things. As long as we're making money, you know, we have to keep the business going. It's true. It's not funny. But the, you know that if you don't have, you don't get, we say. If you don't have money, you don't get a wife. If you don't have beauty, you don't get a husband. That's true. You know? But Jesus is different. So Jesus doesn't look at these things. He looks at the person. What, Eva? No, you are not ugly. Shut up, Louis. Who is this person? In Malta, when I was young, it was like, who is your family? Who is your father? I think it's still there in our society. We call it classism. Who is your father? Who are you? You know, if you're, if you're protesting or if you're protesting in a certain place of work, it depends who your father is. It makes everything. It makes or breaks. If my father was an important person and I speak, boom, they will pick it up and they'll do it. My father was a farmer, you know? Even when I went to secondary school and I was choosing my subjects, he didn't come, he didn't consult me, he didn't counsel me, he couldn't. He didn't know enough to counsel me, you know? But thank God I had good teachers who saw the potential and, you know, tried to help me. If those teachers saw me and said, oh, your father is nothing, I wouldn't be who I am today. You see, so the family, we can see the family. Qualification, who are you? Where do you work? What education level do you have? And the third is nationality. Where do you come from? Are you black, are you white? 
it makes a big difference. When I was in America, uh, being black or white made a big difference. Uh, you actually, people trusted you more if you're white. That's what I heard, because I only stayed there for four months. But it made a big difference. They told me, they said, look, here, you know, if you are black, you have to work twice as hard, you have to prove yourself twice as hard, and get paid less. I said, wow, is it that big a difference? They said, yes. The people treat you differently. Then there's age. For those of you who are past a certain age, <laughs> people people treat you differently. If you age, if you if you age, they see that maybe you are more vulnerable, so they treat you differently. There are certain certain cultures. If you are young, they treat you differently <coughs> because you know nothing. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a big one: is gender. If you are a woman you are not so respected as a man. You're not supposed to be as respected as a man. You know? You ask, you're supposed to respect more than be respected. So gender is a big one. And uh, all these things are just putting it in our heads. How do I see you? If you come in front of me right now, how do I see you? Do I see you as a woman, as a man, as an old man, as a young man, as a black, a white, somebody who has education or not? This is the way we see you. It's not the way God sees it. It's not the way God sees it. In my experience, um, we are four in my family, and I'm the second. And the second child is always uh, rebellious, they say. The second child is the rebellious child who always goes against everybody. And I didn't dream of doing that because when I was young, I was taught to be very submissive to my parents and very submissive in my family and in my community. I have to be the last one to speak and all these things. So my brother, who was 10 months older than me, he was the leader. He'll be the one to talk if someone comes to our house. He'll be the one to uh, solve problems. And, and so I was always quiet. In fact, when I used to speak, my mom would say, and my, and my brother would come through the door. My mother would say, shh, wait, 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 wait. And she's looking to hear what my brother would say. You know, because it was not my place to speak. So when I became a Christian, and then I went to this prayer meeting and then I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I want to tell my family. And then I go home and I say, Lord, how am I going to tell my family? I, my family has never listened to me. I'm not important. I'm the second child. If I speak, I'm going to be rebellious. <laughs> so what am I going to do? And I go home and I try to find my mom in a quiet time where my brother is not there. You know? It's like, oh, okay, yes, 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 yes. But we have things to do. You know? And it was so rejected. I couldn't play my worship tapes because somebody's brainwashing me. You know? That, that is what it comes to. Because they used to think, you shouldn't have a mind of your own. You should follow us. But you see, Jesus, when he came, comes into your life, he just comes into your life. He doesn't say, oh, I'm going to cause you a lot of problems, so I'm not going to come into your life. I'm not going to 